Dear Heavenly Father, we once again come to you and we just invite your presence here. Yes. Be with Bill as he shares. Bless him with your spirit. Bless him with calmness. Give him direction. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Blessings. Thank you, Travis. <clears throat> I am going to do something a little bit different this morning, and uh, I, I'm going to expose myself a little more than I typically like to do when I preach, but I will do that. Um, I'm going to show you my notes, okay? How's that? So uh, I'm going to use a PowerPoint and, and just work my way through the notes, and if I just read them, then, then we might have lunch early. If I happen to add a few commentaries, then, then you might have lunch late. Um, I'll try to, to find the right balance to that. But typically, I wouldn't like to, for people to see my notes. But as a disclaimer, I've been working on this message for 10 years. I've not preached it anywhere. And so this is, this is something that, that has been burning in my heart. And I'm not sure that even today that I can tell you what I feel. We have, we as churches, ADC, Anabaptist Disciples of Christ, have moved from regulation-based church operation to non-regulation-based operation. And my question is, is that maintainable? And what will it take for us to maintain what we believe in, in order to survive our, our times. Now, this, this has been brewing in my heart, and, and I have struggled immensely to create an outline that works. And so it may not work. So forgive me if it does not work. I also want you to understand that what I'm going to present to you is not totally comprehensive. Uh, The scripture that I will be using in my outline and text is the ESV. Mostly, there may be a few cases where I've used the King James. Another thing about this message is not, it's not typically what I like to do. I like to preach more of an expository message out of a text. That's my favorite in listening, and it's my favorite in when I'm trying to prepare a message as well. This is not. This takes a scope from the beginning of Genesis to um, at least the Gospels and some of the epistles. So I'm picking out a lot of different thoughts as we go along. So I've put, I have put my notes, I have got a sequential diagram which will not make sense to most of you and they may, may, it may put most of you to sleep. I'll try not to allow that to happen. But if it does, then it, well, I will take it on myself. So I have, I have about I have seven different points or seven different sequences that I want to pr proceed through in order for us to get what I'm trying to tell you. And the, 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 the message this morning is, is one word, and it's called truth. Truth. That's it. So... With that said, maybe we could have the screen and I'll try to get my computer and hopefully it works. Is it up there? Okay. Thanks to Brother Myron yesterday he came out and met me early here because I've had a little bit of problems uh, my computer linking and I wanted to make sure that we didn't have the same stuff and so when I put my outline up on the screen it was pretty blurry and I went home and remodeled the whole thing so I had an extensive amount of work yesterday to try to get this so that it's in readable form and hopefully understandable form so let me begin, and I won't ask you to stand. You don't have to turn in the scripture if you can see the screen. I will read the text from the screen. And I'm going to jump through a number of, of verses uh, to read the text, and it's, it's not all in the same uh, uh, 
continuous. I, I skip verses because I'm trying to get to the, imper, in, the pertinent points in, in hopes that, that what we say will make sense. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. Then God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and every living thing that moves on the earth. Genesis 2, 7 through 9. Then God, then the Lord God formed man of the dust of the, of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living creature. And the Lord God planted a garden in Eden, in the east, and there he put man whom he had formed. And out of the ground the Lord God made, the, made to spring up every tree that is pleasant for the sight and good for food, and the tree of life in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Genesis 2:15 through 18. And the Lord took, and the Lord God took man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and keep it. And the Lord commanded the man, saying, Ye may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. Then the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. Amen to that. I will make him a helper fit for him. Genesis 2.23 then, the then the man said, This is... This at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman. Isn't that amazing? Because she was taken out of man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall be one flesh. And the man and the wife were both naked and were not ashamed. So here is the outline, the sequence that I want to look at these things. First, I want to look at truth and the creation of and the two trees. Secondly, I want to look at the perfection that was found in the Garden of Eden. Thirdly, I want to look at the fall of men. Fourthly, I want to look at natural law. Fifthly, I want to look at the law and the Torah, the law of Moses and the Torah. I want to look at John 1.17. Grace and truth came by Jesus. Then I want to take a detour. I really hate to do this, but I feel like this message cannot avoid taking this detour. So I want to take the rejection of truth and take a deep dive, but short, into the rejection of truth. And then I want to come back and finish with number six, grace and truth, the conclusion, grace and truth came by Jesus. Those are my points. Those are the sequence that I want to take through here, and hopefully by the end I pray to God that it may make a little bit of sense to you. So before I really dive into this, let's pray. Father, I thank you this morning for your presence. I thank you for the body, the church of Jesus Christ. I thank you for the body of Christ here at Bethel, here in Berlin, Ohio. And Lord, I pray that there may be true life true spirit, true understanding of who you are and what you have provided for us so that we might truly be found in you when you return back to take us home. Bless our time together. Give clarity of thought and mind and speech for your glory and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. So let's go to the first one. So here is the beginning of this graph. So I'm going to create a sequence that will reach all across the screen when we're done, okay? So if you can tell how close I'm done by the time that all the, all the, all the prongs reach over there, okay? So uh, don't get too restless. You, if, you, if, you, if you don't understand, just fall asleep and then we'll have lunch. 
Okay, so I want to talk about truth, creation, and the two trees. That's my first point. God created man in his own image. God formed man out of the dust of the ground. He breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. Isn't that amazing? You take dirt and you put something, you form something, and he made him in the image of God. And he breathed into his nostrils and man became alive. He became a living soul. Secondly, still on the same point, by the way, the top line you will see the sequences. It's number one. So there were multiple slides with number one, multiple with two, and so forth. Just for clarity's sake. All right? God planted a garden in Eden. He planted trees that are beautiful. He planted trees that are good fruit, have good fruit. He planted the tree of life in the middle of the garden. I want you to get that. He planted a tree, the tree of life in the middle of the garden. This is not a fake tree. This is a true tree. It is a tree of life. All right? And he planted another tree in the garden that is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Significant, important points there. So, let's look at the fruit of these trees. God said, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. So let's look at the fruit of these trees. First, the tree of life. What was the fruit of this tree? Life. We later on will come back and we'll see that God said, I'm going to put put an angel with a two-edged sword so that these people don't come back and eat of the tree of life and live forever. Not going to happen. Not going to happen. Not going to allow that because they would then come back and live in their sin until... and we would be eternally lost, eternally damned, with eternal, so-called eternal life, but not heavenly eternal life. But the tree of life has life. Secondly, the tree of life is full of truth. It is truth. The tree of life gives freedom. The fruit of the tree of life brings freedom. The fruit of the tree of life, and catch this, has freedom, and freedom always leads to innocence. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil. They were told that the tree of the knowledge of good and evil was full of wisdom, something to be desired, something to eat of. You want wisdom. You you would get knowledge. Now, doesn't that sound like the world today? If you want to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, if you want to know what's right and wrong, you eat this. You want wisdom. You want knowledge. Go get it. All right? You will be able to discern good from evil or right from wrong. You you will, yeah, I already said that. You will see right from evil or right from wrong. So he, this, this, does that sound kind of Okay. Sounds kind of okay, doesn't it? You want to know right from wrong? All right. So, we'll leave that and we'll go to the perfection of the garden. Okay. So, in the, in the garden, it was perfect. There was life, truth, freedom, and innocence. You see it on my graph if you can read it from back there. So, here, people were made, God made people, made man. When I use the word man through this course, this course here, I don't just mean a man, I mean mankind. So please understand that. So I'm not excluding the women. God created man a tri, tri, trichotomy. Trichotomy is a division of three categories. God, see, God made man in his own image. And we confuse sometimes and think, well, how does God look? Does he look like one of you? Does he look like man, man and male and female are not the same? Does he, do, who, who, what does he look like? From my, from my understanding, being made in the image of God is this. Body, although God is a spirit, soul and spirit. God has body if he wants body. So 
Man is a trichotomy, body, soul, and spirit. So let's look at what this means for us in the image of God. The body was perfect. Hey, you young men who think that you are strong and have a great physique, and you young ladies who look at the young men and say, man, those are handsome young men, and they are near perfection. Let me tell you something. Nothing compared to Adam. Totally different from what you see when, when you look at evolution that we started as a monkey and then we get better and better. I'm telling you what, we were at the perfect form in the very beginning. The perfect man. And it has all devolved into monkeys. Not really. But we're not evolving up. The perfection was there in the very beginning. He created man and woman with a soul. That, that means they had a mind. Remember, this is the image of God. He made them with the ability to think, a mind to think and to remember. He made them, this is key, I underlined it. He, he made them with volition or free will. Freedom of decision and choice. God did not create a bunch of robots and put them in the garden. He made them with an emotion, the ability to love, hate, become angry, to be sad, or to be happy. Has God ever done that? This is a description of the image of God, so-called. Really reduced down, by the way. He made man with a spirit. So he gave man a body, because a spirit without a body, where is he? So he gave man a body to put his spirit in him. But the spirit, the spirit is where you and I worship God. The spirit is where you and I commune and have relationship and fellowship with, with a God who is a spirit. They that worship me must worship, worship me in spirit and in truth. God made us that way. Now, we go to the third uh, sequence. The sequence of the fall of man. I have one line that stretches all the way to the end, so don't think that I'm quite done that yet, though. The question I have about the fall of man, did God give man a choice? God said like this, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. How many of you have children? Okay. Some of you reluctantly, reluctantly identify that you have children. Sorry for your children. No. So if you tell your child, you can wash the dishes or wash the car, do they have a choice? Do they have a choice? Yeah, they have a choice. If you tell your child, wash the dishes, do they have a choice? They can make a choice. You didn't give them a choice. Right? If you just say, wash the dishes, you're not giving them a choice. God said, of the tree of the knowledge of good even evil, you shall not eat. That sound like a choice to you? That was not a choice. That was not a choice. However, God had created man in his own image with volition, free will. Uh, so, so they could choose. They did choose. But God didn't give them a choice. You know what God gave them? This is important. You know what God gave them? 
God gave them truth. He said, you may eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. If you eat of it, you're going to die. That was truth. That is truth. Now, before the fall, before eating, there was in the garden bliss and beauty. There was communion with God. There was life. There was freedom. They had the freedom. And most of all, one of the greatest things in the world, one of the greatest things, my brothers and sisters, the greatest thing in the world is innocence. may not agree but I think that's the greatest thing in the world that you could find is innocence and the only way the only way that you can have true innocence is to have true freedom and God gave it to them and they had that they had communion with God they had life they had they had bliss and beauty they had the possibility of living forever by eating of the tree of life. And then the tree, after they ate, post-fall, post-eating, what do they have? Guilt. Shame. Broken communion. A sin nature that's passed on to you and me. Blame game. Not my fault, someone else. Ultimately, a place where we're all going to go. Death. Death. Fall of man. Look at what they had before. This is significant. We'll come back to this. So the consequences of this fall was that God drove out man from the east of the Garden of Eden and placed a cherubim and a flaming sword that turned every way to guard, notice, the way to the tree of life. Genesis 3.24. The way to life. The way to life. God removed man from the garden. He barred man from the tree of life, eternal life. Freedom was lost. Innocence was lost. They were forced to live by the choice that they had made. And what was that choice? To know right from wrong. Question. How do you know what's right and what's wrong? How do you know? It's one way. The law. The law. They were forced to live by the law that they had chosen. They chose to live by the law. And so after they, and after they, they did, now I will acknowledge we're coming to, to sequence four. Sequence four is about the natural law, and I will acknowledge that the natural law probably extended all the way into the very beginning of creation. I will acknowledge that, but I only show it from here because I think that the natural law was irrelevant until they fell. It was inconsequential. It didn't matter. They didn't care. Didn't matter. But the natural law, let's look at it. The natural law was recognized. Now, I'm taking, now jumping to the New Testament and reading from chapter Romans chapter 1 and verse 20. And this is what it says, ESV. For since the creation of the world, since the creation of the world's God's invisible qualities 
His eternal power and His divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what, they ha what has been made so that the people are without excuse. What's he saying? He is saying, the Apostle Paul, when he was writing Romans, he was simply saying that there is a natural law in effect. And if people who are unbelievers look at the natural law of, uh, that is in effect, they can see that there is a creator, a God in heaven, who created it, who makes it function. Why doesn't the earth go out of orbit? Why doesn't it start spinning, spinning out of control? He is simply telling us here that it can be clearly seen and understood. Even those that do not believe in God, if they open their eyes, they will see. And they will be accountable. They are so that people... I don't like this. Are without excuse. Don't we all like to make excuse? He says, so that people are without excuse. So, what are we talking about? We're talking about physics. Unchangeable nature, laws of nature. Now, for instance, you can say what you will and say, hey, I, gravity has no power over me. Prove it. Even a guy in a glider, he'll come down. Even an airplane, you stop the motors, they'll come down. It's not just gravity, but there's all hosts of things that in physics that are, that, that are fixed, that are immutable, unchangeable, that will go on. The natural, this natural law will continue until the very end. Not changeable. All the great scientists that are in the world should be able to see that there is a designer that has done this. We have male and female. I realize today that many in the world can't tell the difference. It's totally astounding to me. I have no biology degree, but I can tell a difference. And so can you. And it's a shame for people who say, we can't, uh, we can't tell you what a woman is. These are natural law. Light and darkness. It's going to be there day and night. Life and death. Has anyone been able to survive forever? No. They freeze people nowadays to keep them so that they can, after many, many years, bring them back and... I don't know. You know what? They're going to die. They'll die. Natural law continues to the end of time. It does not change. Fifthly, our fifth sequence is the law, the Torah, or the law by Moses. And you notice that I have that starting at a different... And by the way, this, this is not a timeline. This is just a sequence. So the, the law of Moses came into being. And we'll look at the law of Moses next. Are you okay? All right. If you're not okay, let's stand. You want, any, every, anybody want to stand? Yeah, stand. Okay. I didn't see anyone sleeping, so don't get the idea that I'm punishing you. I'm just wanting to move a little bit of blood so that we... Because the natural law of sitting still will cause you to be drowsy. And, and hearing a drone of a man's voice continually will also put you to sleep. There is something beautiful about, and I don't do this a lot because I don't like the sport of baseball, but if I want to fall asleep, that is a good way to do it. <coughs> you may be seated. So, the law of the Torah. For the law, the Torah was given by Moses... This is one of the key verses. The law was given by Moses. I inserted the Torah because it's offensive to some people who say, well, you know, no, that's not talking about the law. It's talking about the Torah. Well, okay. So it's talking about the law. In my opinion, it's pretty, pretty much the same thing. Includes the Ten Commandments, by the way. 
The law was given by Moses, but grace and truth, grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. All right? Now, Galatians 3.19, here is a very key verse. Why then the law? And by the way, this is not my words. This is, this is the words of ESV. Why then the law? It was what? It was added. It was added because of what? The transgression. It was added because of the fall. Why then the law? It was added because of the transgression until the offspring should come whom the promise had been made. Until what? The offspring of who? Until Jesus would come. I'm warm, but I got goosebumps. It was added because of the transgression, because of the fall, until the time that Jesus was to come. The law was added because man chose to violate, to violate the truth that God had given them in the garden. God, I said that God said, you shall not eat of that tree. That was just truth. It was a commandment, it was truth. But it was not a choice. They had a choice, and they chose because they were made in the image of God with the opportunity to make choice. They violated the principle that God had gave them, the truth that God had given them and they, in the garden. And from that time forward, man is forced to live under the law. So do you know what? We as non, we as before we're born again, we're very comfortable under the law. And I will get to this in a moment. Too many of us experience the grace of God and are comfortable continuing to live under the law. And I'm here to tell you this morning that that is not where we are to live. But man was forced to live under the law. The law was knowing good and evil. For by the works of... Now I'm going to go to different passages here. For by the works of the law, no human being is being justified in his sight since the law comes with the law comes knowledge of sin. What is the law for? To show you sinfulness. That's how you know right from wrong. It, all, it goes all the way back to the garden. They wanted to know right from wrong and God said, okay, I'll give it to you. And he gave them the law. He gave them the law of Moses. This came later, many years later. They lived by the natural law until Moses came and he gave them the law to clarify the natural law and all the laws of God that he wanted them to have. And it's through the law that we know the knowledge of sin. There, uh, where there is no law, there is no transgression. If you notice, by the way, and I laid in telling you, wherever it's in italics, it's a direct quote from Scripture. If it's not in italics but a reference behind it, I just made it a word or so to clarify it. Where no law is, there is no transgression. The law brings wrath. That word wrath is punishment or penalty. Romans 4.15 Sin is not counted where there is no law. Romans 5.13 I've uh, traveled to Florida and uh, on the interstate and the, the, usually the, the speed limit is about 75. Most people drive 80. So, yeah, guilty. I do. But I've driven in Germany going down the Autobahn at 80, 85 miles an hour, and some guy comes whizzing by at 115. Nobody stops him. Nobody. You know why? He's not guilty of anything. There's no law. There's no law. 
it's awfully dangerous, but there's no law. The law does not, I want you to get this, the law does not empower or enable you to overcome every, the, the very thing it condemns you of. So the law puts you in guilt, but it does not empower you to live above it or to have a remedy for the thing that you may be struggling with. The law, breaking of the law brings guilt. That brings me to number six. <clears throat> Grace and truth came by Jesus. So I want to look at Grace and justification. It says grace and truth. I want to look at grace first. <clears throat> Excuse me. For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. For all have sinned and for, fall short of the glory of God and are justified by His grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Do you get that? How do you have your sins forgiven? By living good, by scoring up points, by counting the weights on the scale. No, we are, being, we, we are forgiven of our sins by the grace of God and, our, and we're justified by that. If that frees us. Grace removes guilt and brings redemption. The highest outcome of grace, my brothers and sisters, and redemption is innocence. Because there's forgiveness. When you have forgiveness, you become innocent before God. And there is no greater place in the world to be than to be in innocence before an almighty God. You can respond to this. How many of you have been guilty before God? Okay, thank you. How many have you... Exp how, you don't have to raise your hand. But I think most of you would raise your hand. How many of you have experienced the, the glorious experience of innocence before God? How did you get it? You worked hard. You did better. You obeyed every jot and tittle of the law. No. It was grace. It was grace that brought you redemption and forgiveness and innocence. And justification. Christ is come, Christ is become of no effect unto you, whoever you are, just who are justified by the law, you are fallen from grace. Sorry. Far too many, please get this, far too many of our people come to the place where they say, I have accept, accepted Jesus as my Savior. You know what that is? That is the experience of grace. I don't like the terminology of accepting Jesus as my Savior. It's more than that. It's deeper than that. It's having our sins forgiven. It's finding redemption and, and acknowledging Him that He has, acknowledging that He has washed us with His blood and that we have a, a Savior. We've been redeemed. And now we receive that grace and that for, forgiveness. But we continue to live under the law. Let me back up. Uh, I'm backing too far. I won't. So we ask the question. If you want to test if you're living under the law, here's a test. Read that. We ask. Can I do this? Can I do that? What is allowed here? What is right? What is wrong? Now, brothers and sisters, don't get me wrong. There's always right and wrong. The law always exists. It never goes away. It will always exist. And when we fall from grace and we cease to follow the truth, we will immediately drop and come under the effects of the law. And then this becomes pertinent. But if you're asking these questions, then you might look deeper into your heart and say, what am I following? We ask, can I do this? Can I do that? Is this right? 
Is this wrong? Why can they do this and I can't do that? Get out from the law. Live above the law. Consequently, my dear brothers and sisters, there's many who have received Jesus Christ as their Savior and, and they have their sins forgiven and then they continue to live in guilt and shame and struggle. And that is not where God wants us to live. We need to live from, from being saved by grace and living in the law to being saved and by grace and moving and living in truth, which is the next one that I'll show you. See, I, if you look at my graph here, the, many experience grace and allow the law to control them, but God wants us to live in truth and in freedom and in innocence above the law. Above the law. So the question becomes, can I do this? Can I do that? No. You know what the question becomes? What is truth? What is truth? Grace and truth came by Jesus. The law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Truth is what? Bible says, sanctify them through thy truth, through the truth. Your word is truth, since John 17, 17. You want to know what truth is? Where do you get your sanctification? Where do you get your struggles taken care of? Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. It's found in truth. The new covenant is not a new law. It is truth. You get that? The new covenant that God has given us is not a new set of laws. It is a truth that he wants us to follow. One that receives the grace of Jesus should want to, believe, want to live in truth. The law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus. Truth is being filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. How do you get it? By abiding in truth. Now I'm going to take a detour here. The rejection of truth. Let me... I'm sorry. Can lunch wait? I'm going to finish. <clears throat> the rejection of truth is, is something that we are seeing all around ourselves. And the, people reject truth. You see the, the sequence here. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteous men who by their unrighteousness do what? Suppress the truth. It doesn't say the law. It says the truth. They suppress the truth. If you want to know where I'm going, open your Bible when you get home and read Romans chapter 1 and you will find a list of debaucheries and evil and wickedness that, that all comes from, the dis, from, from departing from the truth. Therefore, listen to this. God gave them up to the lust of their hearts, to impurity, to his dishonoring their bodies among themselves because they exchanged the truth of God, about God, for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passions. Suppression of the truth, Romans 1.18. Exchanging the truth for God, of God into a lie. People's minds become darkened. The mind becomes reprobate. King James says reprobate. I really like that word better. That means worthless, cast away, and rejected. The mind becomes reprobate. Do we see that? Let me give you an illustration here in a moment. They claim to be wise, but they're fools. I didn't say that. Bible says it. 
God gives them up to the lust of their hearts. They dishonor their bodies. I'm telling you, if you read the news or if you're up to the news at all, you will feel and see that this is happening in America today. Here's, I want to show you this just as a very quick visual for you to understand where we're at. Fallen mankind is in need of redemption. If you go to Millersburg, Dover, New Philly, Worcester, wherever you want to go, wherever your neighbor, most of your neighbors are on this level right here. Fallen man, they need redemption. Okay? They're just sinful people. That's where you were, by the way. Did you know that? I was. Now, Romans chapter 1 describes something else. He describes a person that has become reprobate in mind. So it's kind of like a three-story house. Most sinners live on the main floor. Okay? And those who become reprobate in the mind live in the basement. Okay? That's not all of mankind. But do you know that our country is being controlled largely, largely by people who have become reprobate in their minds? And they are trying to drag the rest of us down to that level of, of life. But you know what's better? A redeemed mankind. A man and a woman who have become redeemed. And they know truth. And they experience freedom. They are elevated above. They're not here on the main floor, nor are they down in the basement. But they're elevated above. That does not make you a better person than they, except for the grace of Jesus Christ and following his truth. Okay. My detour is over. We'll come back and finish now. Okay. Grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. For the law was given by Moses, Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus. What is truth? Jesus said like this, listen carefully, I am the way. Where did we see the word the way before in our message? Probably you can't remember, but I went over this often enough, I do remember. It says that they put, put an angel to guard the way to life. Jesus said, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. He is the tree of life. He is life. No one comes to the Father except by me. And then he says, Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word or your word is truth. Jesus is the living word. Do you know Jesus? Are you living in the word of Jesus? Jesus is the living word and he is the truth. Jesus said, I am the truth. But also the scripture is written, is the written word and the truth. In its entirety, by the way. To live in truth is to live in the new, new covenant. The new covenant. Brothers and sisters, we must get a hold of this, that we are living in the new covenant, not the old covenant, but the new covenant, wherein is life and freedom and innocence. But if we live in the old covenant, I'll tell you the problem that we will have. We will struggle with guilt and shame and blame and misery and struggles. We must live in the new covenant. This is not a new law. It is truth. The Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7, the best sermon that was ever preached in the world. He says, you have heard. What was he saying? The law. You have heard, don't commit adultery. And then he says, but I say to you. What does he tell you? Does he give you a new commandment? Does he give you a new rule? Does he give you a new law? No, he gives you truth. And if you start reading the New Testament and looking at it and saying, this is truth, it will, it will open your eyes to what we are to be. 
The new covenant is found in the, in the, in the scriptures, the, in, the, in the New Testament. In Hebrews, I don't have time. This would make multiple messages. But it, it, the, the new covenant is described in Hebrews and it says, if the old was good enough, I wouldn't have given you a new one. But the old wasn't good enough. It can't save you. And I'm giving you a new one wherein Jesus brought the new covenant with grace and truth. And the grace is what forgives our sins and gives us redemption. And the truth is where we walk and live and have our being. And that, my friends, is what's going to safeguard us. We must move from law to grace and truth. Jesus said, For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. What was the, what was the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees? It was based on the law. It was obedience to the law. I'll measure up. I'll check marks here. I'll, I'll add my points here. And hopefully it'll outweigh mine over here. But brothers and sisters, that will not pass us today. It won't. Then said Jesus, almost done. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, if you continue in my word, then are you my what? Disciples. Do we have disciples here? How do you know if you are his disciples? If you continue in his word. Jesus is the living word. The scripture is the written word. And you are my disciples indeed, and you will what? No truth. You know what's amazing to me? I hear people say, well, that's your truth, but my truth is different. No. No. Forever no. Truth is truth. It doesn't vary. Truth is truth. And what God says is true is true. And what God says is a lie is a lie. It's not your truth and my truth. It's God's truth. Everything that is true stems back to God somehow. And everything that is not true stems down to the devil himself who is the father of lies. But what I really like, you will know the truth. What I really like is the truth will make you say it. Free. The truth will make you free. The highest outcome of truth is freedom. We must move from the law to grace, from the law to grace and truth. Grace to believe and repent of our sins, receive forgiveness and redemption by Jesus Christ. We must come to truth, continue in his word, be his disciple and know the truth, and be restored to freedom. And what I like the most about the restoration of being restored to freedom is the innocence. You know what the most beautiful thing in the world is? Innocence. Innocence. Your little children, who before they know right and wrong, who before they know to come under the law, and they're innocent, they're living like, almost like they were in the garden except that they have a fallen nature. They didn't in the garden to begin with, but we've inherited that now. But there is a beauty in innocence when you see that innocence. And I maintain to you this morning that what God wants to do, what Jesus came to do, is he came to, to, to restore us back to the state that Adam and Eve were in the garden before the fall and to create us and to put us in an image into the position that they had with God before they fell and restore that to us today where we can live in truth, in, in freedom 
and in innocence before him. There is nothing more beautiful than to be guiltless. Jesus brought us to grace and truth to deliver us from the bondage of the law, to restore us the right to eat of the tree of life, restore us life, freedom, innocence, bliss, and beauty, and restore beauty uh, us to the communion of, of God. And I'm going to stop right there. I won't recap. Well, maybe I won't. Jesus came to earth to bring grace and truth. He, oh, yes, this is an important fact because of time I almost skipped it. Jesus came to earth to bring us grace and truth. Jesus left the earth and returned to glory to sit at the right hand of the Father and intercede for us. So that, and this is almost a direct quote, but I changed it a little bit. So that he could send the spirit of truth to guide us into all truth. He will not speak of his own authority, but whatever he hears, that will he speak. John 16, 13. He's talking about the Holy Spirit. And when you walk in truth, you can have that too. You can have him too. And walk in truth. So I won't recap that, but I'll go right there to the conclusion. That concludes my message. Thank you for listening. Thank you for those who uh, were patient as I journeyed through my notes here. And hopefully it made a little bit of sense. So thank you. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your grace, your love, your mercy. Thank you for your truth. Dear God, I just pray that you would help us today to walk in truth, to come out from under the bondage of sin and under the bondage of the law, and to find freedom in Christ Jesus and in his truth. Thank you for this time together. And pray your blessing upon each one that has come today in Jesus' name.